Hi everybody, welcome to the Black and White Show. A very, uh, very happy uh, weekend to you all. Hope you've all started your Monday week in blistering form. But we are joined by Carl, who is one of the newbies on Newcastle Fans TV. But we've also got a very special guest. We've got Alex, who was on Will Radio Show just a few weeks before lockdown, wasn't it, Alex? We were talking about uh, the Nust, and he's back again. And this is your chance to fire hundreds and hundreds of questions at Alex. Anything you like. Maybe you want to ask him about his beards. Maybe you want to ask him about the takeover or what the nuts do. It's entirely up to you. Remember to WhatsApp us. WhatsApp us. You'll see the number up here on your screen. And um, thank you very much for coming on, Alex. Uh, how's it been uh, for you the last couple of weeks or so? It's been it's been intense. And thanks for having me on, uh, both of you. It's great to be here speaking to your uh, your viewers. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of Newcastle fans TV. You know that they have told that in the past. So. Just looking forward to getting stuck in to anything anyone wants to ask, to be honest with you. Yeah, please do. You'll see the WhatsApp number ticking across the bottom, and you will also show a few of the banners so you can get involved and ask Alex some direct questions. He's told us off camera you want some hard ones, so fire them at us. Uh, but just before we get into those questions, we want to just highlight once more a few of our uh, YouTubers, Newcastle YouTubers ourselves, Magpie Channel, Toon Review, and Ian Smith all got, a vet, got together to, to come up with this video. Newcastle United is a one-of-a-kind, unique football club. It doesn't matter what gender you are, what religion you are, what skin colour you are, and what sexuality you are. As long as you love the black and white, then you are accepted by our incredible fan base. We all have our opinions about our club, especially in the uncertain future that we all face. But now is the time when we all need to be united. We need to move on past all the arguments on Twitter, the squabbles on Facebook and the abuse on YouTube. All the negativity that could divide a fan base needs to stop. We all need to be united. So we are asking you to back the Newcastle United Supporters Trust. The Newcastle United Supporters Trust can ask questions to our club about improving our great club. The aim is to get positive influences for all the issues you may have as a supporter of this great club. Just one pound, your voice will be heard. Your ideas will be listened to and you will be kept up to date about any dialogue that the club has with the NUST. Finally, let's all keep supporting our wonderful club. This club is like no other when we are united. This club can achieve anything it wants to. Be united. Be united. Be united. Be united. Be united. Be United is the message there, Alex. Uh, Alex, how important is it that a lot of, not just not just those four fan groups, but all over your Facebooks and your Twitter, now start coming up together and Be United is one? Massively important. That's a brilliant video. And well done to all of you lads for working together to make stuff like that. And there's a lot of incredibly passionate and gifted Newcastle United fans, not just in the North East, but across the world. And it's been a real shame that over the past 13 years, probably Mike Ashley's biggest asset has been how much we've fought together amongst ourselves about boycotts, about how to support the team. You know, the support has just been beset by disunity. And if anything positive comes from this takeover, if it doesn't go through, it's that, that fans seem to have come together for once and thought, actually, we've got more in common than we have in difference and we can make our voice heard. And I think the fact that, you know, we got nearly 8,000 members to email MPs across the country, um, to try and force the Premier League to at least break a silence. Um, that, you know, although that was a support of trust effort, it really was an effort from Newcastle fans from all over the UK. And it, and it had an impact and you know, it might not have been the impact we're all desperate for in terms of the takeover going through. It had an impact in forcing the Premier League to say something when clearly their plan had been to say absolutely nothing. So we, we could do some great things together as a fan base, wherever you're located. Um, if, if we act in the common interest, which is the good of the football club. Uh, my first question that I want to fire at Alex, before I know Carl wants to, is for the people who don't know who you are, can you tell us all about yourself? Okay, yeah. So my name is Alex. Um, I live in North Tyneside, um, Newcastle supporter, season ticket holder. Um, got involved a little bit in, in kind of fan activities when 2016, now over four years ago, um, I started a, a thing called Gallagher Flags, uh, which we kind of merged into War Flags after I left it in 2017. Um, it's gone on to bigger and better things, but you know, those first few displays we did in the Gallagher, 
I think I think our first fundraiser we raised eight grand in there. Huddersfield at home was the first game that we uh, put on, and it was kind of one of those things where it was going to be the you know the first game was it, we would do it again, and it was like wow the response from the support um, was absolutely incredible. We moved on from that onto surfer flags. Uh, the famous, you know, the We Are United flag, which everyone will probably know watching this. We, you know, we held fundraisers at the club and we might get onto it a little bit later, but the support we got from Newcastle United then was just out of this world. We had Paul Dummett and Matt Ritchie at um, events. We had uh, Rafa Benitez donating and stuff. It was just, it was probably the golden age of that championship season, wasn't it? Of supporter and club cooperation. The support was United. Um you know, alongside that, I've run the True Faith fanzine now since about then, since 2017. Host the podcast. Um, the fanzine's the, the only print fanzine left. If anyone watching this would like to write for it, you know, the fanzine and True Faith it just exists to, to give fans a voice, really. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. And then in 2018, which I think I was invited to join the Supporters Trust board, um, the trust was in a bit of a bad way. There was some very good people there. But we, we realised it kind of needed a complete relaunch in 2019. It was the day after we beat Man City, actually, at home under Rafa. Um, a few of us got together at the Lytton Phil in Newcastle and thought, you know what, let's give this another go. And, you know, we started off with with no members, no money, no website. So we didn't have a lot and a lot of hard work. Up to this point, Scott, we're close to 14,000 members now, making one of the biggest, if not the biggest, I'm not sure on that, supporters group in the country in terms of paid membership. Um, and I'm the chair of the trust, but you know, all I do is kind of lead the board. Um, I was elected last year um, in the elections. We'll have, we'll have elections coming up in September again. There'll be more information on that soon. And we just believe in fan led democratic process and we want to give supporters a voice in the way their club is run with the football club and in the media. And we think it's a good way of doing it. Thank you very much, Alex. Carl, any questions? Yeah, I've got I've got a few. Uh, to be fair, and um, unfortunately, Alex, it is going to be pretty much takeover related. Um, I'm okay. sure you're getting bored of it, but um, <laughs> I had a brief listen to one of your podcasts um, via True Faith earlier. Um, one point that stuck out for me was um, regarding the Premier League letter. You mentioned that obviously you're all briefed on not sending anything out to the media. However, certain parts of the media had already been briefed prior. At the, the evening prior. So I just wanted to ask with regards to that, Premier League and Pith aside, how much of a negative influence on this takeover do you think the media itself has had? Great question, Carl. Um, I mean, if there's a personal view here, I'll say that. Yeah. I can give trust answers, I can give trust views, but as a personal view, I think that the, that the media's had a, a, a huge impact on this takeover. And, and I know that for a fact because... You have journalists from Al Jazeera, Qatar's main uh, news channel, and they're obviously closely linked to BN Sports. And, you know, me, myself, have, they've tried to brief me and say, you know, can you give us a quote on X, Y, and Z, which is very negative about the takeover. And I said, whoa, 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 hang on. That, that's crazy. Um, you know, it was about the World Trade Organization report. And I said, oh, can I read the report? And so the report's embargoed. I said, well, if it's embargoed, I'm not going to make a comment mm -hmm. on something that, I don't know about. So I said that, and that's just me, some dafty in Newcastle who, you know, isn't a journalist or anything like that. The next day, word for word, what I was sent by Al Jazeera appeared in tweets and articles from national football journalists around the country. So that's, that's textbook briefing that, and that was briefing against the takeover. And I'm not mentioning his name, so it wouldn't be fair. He's not here to defend himself. But there's one fairly high profile BBC football journalist who, who tweeted that word for word was called out by a few of the local lads up here. And ended up deleting his tweet, but he that he was briefed, and in, in that briefing was against the takeover. Now, how much relevance came from the Premier League? I, I couldn't answer that because I'm speculating. But there were media people there who were briefing people beyond the Newcastle United fan base against this takeover, and those journalists decided to re to, to basically report what they were briefed, which was against the takeover. Has that helped the Premier League? or made it easier for the Premier League to make a decision, or not make a decision as it was, because the, the support of the public seemed to be with them for stuff like this, only they can answer. But I, you know, to answer your, your question, I think it's had a massive impact, and, and not for the better. Yeah, that's for, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's easy for me to look at it from the outside and see that, but obviously nobody knows who I am, so I've got no credence. So kind of hearing that coming from you will hopefully make people realise how much of a negative effect it has had, unfortunately. Um, moving on from that, um, the, the, with regards to this current um, fresh takeover bid, 
obviously i think you'd probably have the same personal standpoint as me in the sense that i'm not giving it any credence at the moment um just for things that i've read and you know getting alan Sh trying to get alan shearer involved those sorts of things were ringing alarm bells with me and without sounding too negative i personally think it's a bit of a joke um it's obviously what the fifth or sixth time that we're potentially looking to be taken over now i don't see this one going through i mean you're probably more in the know than most people if this doesn't go through which i expect it not to what are the realistic chances of us being taken over this year or next year for that matter yeah it's a really tough one isn't it and again personal view out of the trust view you know i'd be very skeptical like yourself of anything happening you know, I first found out about this this bid from Amanda Stavely in a consortium last May, so May 2019 or April 2019. Um, so Rafa Benitez was still at the club. And, and if you think about how long it's taken them to get to this stage in terms of April, with it, I mean, we're going to ignore the Premier League stuff in terms of getting to the Premier League, working through the books, coming up with the money, coming up with the price, agreeing the price, sorting out the, the company's house, they're sorting out the deal. It took them, well, a year to get there. So the fact we're hearing about stuff now and people at the start of the bid, maybe things can be done quicker. I don't know about it, but from a personal perspective, I still think and it's like this deal or nothing. And I think that's one of the reasons that you see Mike Ashley in the media supposedly so keen on this bid, because he knows how long it takes. And this is yeah. a third of a billion quid he's going to get for his kind of faltering football club in the Premier League. Um, it, it's this one or nothing for me. Fair enough. And uh just bear with me, this is the final one from, from myself, and then I'll let Lee crack on. Um, obviously, we, off the back of the video that we've all put together as well, we do need to stay united. Um, however, if this takeover doesn't go through, um, whether it is this bid or another one pops up immediately and it doesn't go through, how do we move forward as, as a fan base? Um, because obviously, I think we'll all agree we don't want to be stuck watching the same... Um, you know, scenarios that we've had over the past couple of years where we're in this vicious cycle of takeovers, not signing players or signing players on loan or, or players that aren't really going to progress us as a club. And obviously with everything that's gone on with coronavirus, how do we push forward and stay together in a positive way as a fan base moving from here if the takeover doesn't go through? It's a big question, isn't it? Um, I don't think I've got all the answers, but my yeah. my personal opinion would be we'll we have, we have to remember that this football club is special. That's the key. That's the first thing. Okay. And it's easy to forget that sometimes. And sometimes I think the people who run the club have forgotten that already. And remember that we can make things happen. So whatever happens next, and I, I don't have a crystal ball, if we can stay together and, and from a trust perspective, if, if this take if it doesn't happen, then we'll get back around the table with Newcastle United now trying to get some answers for fans and some explanations. Um, we would love to see our membership of the trust grow so that next time we were sat with Lee Charlie, it was maybe with 25,000 members rather than 14,000. The louder our voice and the more we're united, as you say, the harder we are to ignore. I'll give you a good example of that. When, when the takeover first hit the news, a lot of the national media, they were anti-takeover, said the Newcastle United fans were split. There was a massive split about who wanted the takeover and who didn't. In my experience, I'm sure it was the same on Newcastle Fan TV with all your listeners and uh, viewers and subscribers. Everyone wants the takeover to go ahead. Everyone was very excited. So we ran a poll amongst our members and sure enough, 96.7% of our members said they were desperate for the takeover. Within a day, that went around the world. And then every single article about the takeover wasn't, but Newcastle fans don't want this takeover or it's a split to 96.7% because that's proof, that's data. That's not a Twitter poll. That's paying members having their democratic say. And that is a, you know, it's an extreme example because it's about something as big as a takeover. But we, as fans, we corrected that narrative. And that's what we can do about the football club moving forward. That's what we could do the next time Rio Ferdinand or someone like that, or one of Ashley's mates in the media, tell people how good a job he's doing. If if 10,000 people try and ring in and make a different point to, to, to a radio station, they're easy to ignore. If 10,000 people come together with the same message and say, actually, Rio Ferdinand, we're representative of Newcastle United supporters, not you, not whoever's paying you or, or briefing you or anything like that, so if we can stay together with the United voice, and it doesn't mean we'll have to get on about everything. It doesn't mean that every supporter agrees on everything, but I think we all agree on the big picture. The club needs a new owner. Thankfully, the owner seems to see that now. But what he can't do this season, if there's no takeover, is let the, the club fall into disrepair because he's taken his eyes so much off the ball 
that you know we'll start to go backwards in terms of relegation and stuff like that. We've got to work together as a fan base to make sure they know that that we as a fan base aren't going to let them get away with that. Yeah. Brilliant. Cool. All right then, Alex. Uh, preloaded questions. We have social media to get involved as well with some questions. Again, uh, anybody who's watching WhatsApp is the way you'll guarantee to have your um, answers by Alex. Question one, Alex, for you. And this came across as YouTube. Um, it was just basically Mark D was saying, um, sorry, but the NUS has not done enough in recent years to get the fans' opinion across to the owner. If going forward the NUS shows signs of actually getting fans and viewers' questions across, then for sure I'm certain many more would join. How do you feel about that, Alex? No, it's it's fair enough, and that you know that's one of the reasons we, we decided to relaunch the, the trust in early 2019. Um, you know, since then we, were, we haven't even had kind of had a full season because of a coronavirus with them. But you know, it went from kind of no communication with the football club to to me and others putting many hours and many meetings with them about the fan communication process. You know, have they done everything I, I'd have hoped to have? Of course not. Um, could they do much better? Yes. But there has been a bit of progress in terms of communication with the club. But like you know, Mark, the, the easy thing for me to say to to Mark is, I'll say it again: the more of us that there there are, the harder we are to ignore. You know, there is a, a Premier League um, requirement for the club to communicate with its fans, and I don't think it would ever get there. But the ultimate sanction is a points deduction. Um, so it's not like we don't have any leverage. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying for a second we'd push for a points deduction if they didn't speak to the trust or any other fans. But but the club know they're supposed to do it. And coronavirus makes it harder. We were scheduled to have a meeting, well, the first meeting of the season with Lee Charnley as a board um, at the start of this year. That got pushed back because of a couple of things and then coronavirus hit. What I would love nothing more than to get thousands of people together with three or four key points to put across and say to him in a reasonable manner, what are you going to do about this? What is your plan? And then report that back to the members. You know, we can't fix everything, but we can certainly, like Mark correctly says, put it across to the owner. Um, there's no other group at the minute with that kind of access to the club. I'm not saying there shouldn't be, but, you know, easy thing to do is to say you haven't done enough. Even better is to join us, make your voice heard and, and make sure we get it done. Um, uh, it was from Ryan Sweeney over on YouTube. He says, sorry, um, Nustaf, I'm not that key. Nothing to do with the negativity. Uh, we don't know what to spend the money on. So it's more of a question of where the money goes, Alex. Okay. Yeah, there's a few things there from Ryan. Ryan, thank you for your question. That's really helpful. Uh, first of all, half of them don't go to the game. When I go to the game, I have a season ticket and I do at least, you know, 12, 15 away games a season. Um, Thomas, who's on the board, does every single Newcastle game, home and away. Um, a couple of other lads on the board won't, board won't go back. Uh, under Mike Ashley, which is fair enough. So I don't really buy that comment about the don't go to the games. There's only a board of six away. The, the key thing about the board, and, 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 and Ryan's comment says, it's democratically elected. Okay, so you as members, Ryan, if you were a member, this coming September, you can vote for who you want to be in the board. If you think, what well, you know what, these lads don't go to enough games, vote them off, vote someone else on. That's the power of this thing. Um, in terms of, in ter or even better, stand yourself. You know, you could start any member around the world. Don't have to live in Newcastle or anything. You could stand to be on the board. And that's the great thing about open democratic organisations. I mean, if Ryan wants, we can compare loyalty points, but, but we'll not do it in public. Firstly, <laughs> but um, I'm, only I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Alex, plenty of times in the way, do you? <laughs> um, and uh, the thing about money, okay, we, we do know where the money goes because every year we professionally would pay for our accounts to be audited. Um, not only do I have an accountant do it, they are audited, so everything is double checked. You couldn't get a more secure accounting process than at the AGM at the end of the year, and we, we send everything to members. This is how much money we have in the bank, this is how much money we've spent. This is what we spent more money on. To give Ryan a bit more of an indication, what are our major costs at the minute? Um, MailChimp, where we email you know hundreds of thousands of emails to members every year, there's, there's a cost to that. Uh, website, we've been building the website, the member section. Elections cost a bit of money. We'll have legal fees because we're actually a, a you know a, a non-profit a non benefit of the community company. So we'll have some legal fees in terms of trust membership and regulation and stuff like that. Pretty boring stuff, but you know, I think last year we, I, I mean, I don't have it at the top of my head. The vast majority of the money that we'll have stays in the trust bank account. It stays there. There's, there's no kind of you know separate way for it to go off. The trust bank account set up for that me with control i can't just spend money on things it has to be approved by someone else we'll work closely with barclays bank we'll work closely 
with the football, well, yeah, with the Football Supporters Association, who also could regulate us. And we also work with the Financial Conduct Authority. Ryan, if, if we're missing anything, let me know about how we could be more transparent with the money in terms of what we do. But I think we'll do a pretty good job. We'll follow every single rule available to us. And when people have said that to me in the past, they say, where does the money go? I'll say, are you, are you a member? Okay, you're not a member. Well, if you were, you would know that we're sent out this year after our AGM. So here are our public accounts. You can see them. You can also, also download them from the FCA website. So to say that, that people don't know where the money's gone, if you haven't looked, you're not going to know. But we couldn't be more upfront and transparent about where money's spent. Well said. Carl, I'll let you read out uh, question three. Yeah, um, this one's from Kenny Walsh. How many times have you spoke to Ashley in the last 14 years? I mean, he owns Newcastle. How come Premier, the Premier League didn't respond to you over the takeover? It took an MP. OK, thanks for that, Kenny. Well, we're speaking to the Premier League on Wednesday. It, we'll, have a, we'll have a meeting with Richard Masters, um, face to, well, over Zoom, but you, you know what I mean, face to face to put our members' questions to him. I can't guarantee you what answers you'll give, but the fact that the Premier League, we have that relationship with the Premier League, is more than, than any MPs had so far, more than any journalists had so far. And that's not a criticism of them. It's just to highlight the kind of access that supporters trust have in this country. In terms of not speaking to Ashley, it's very difficult. Well, first of all, you know, I've only been involved, like I said, we're really launching the start of 2019. With, there were conversations before coronavirus about meeting Mike Ashley. The issue that the trust has and, and previous people have had is Mike Ashley has no formal role at Newcastle United. He's not a director. He's not on the board. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't take any money out of the club in terms of a salary. The Premier League rules dictate that only, you know, the highest director needs to speak to you. So that's why he's managed to stay off the radar. There's nothing that can stop us there. But it's a good point. And I think one of the reasons that the trust or the fans haven't managed to speak to Ashley in 14 years is because of the stuff we talked about before, the disunity. The fact that Ashley could look at us as a fan base and said they can't even agree amongst themselves how to attack on me. There hasn't been one central focal point to try and engage him or speak to him because we've been so disunited in different fan groups or in different Facebook groups or different YouTube channels and stuff like that. And the video that you, sh you saw at the you know the start of this show shows you that people are working together. And if people work together like this continually, I think it'd be much easier to try and engage Mike Ashley. We do speak to Lee Charlie. I've spoken to Lee Charlie face to face three times this year. Um, and like I said, just before coronavirus hit, we were set for our first board meeting with him uh, as the trust. So we are getting access to the highest point in Newcastle United. You know, I'd, I'd, all I'd say is that we've got more choice to do it if United and together another trust banner than we we'll have uh, away from that. Thank you very much, Alex. Question four for you. And this one's come from Twitter. You would have seen this yourself uh, earlier on. Uh, there's only one question to ask. What does it take for the Premier League to approve the deal? I mean, that's the golden question, isn't it, Alex? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer. From my understanding, from a personal point of view here, is two things. One, um, Saudi uh, PIF <laughs> put forward uh, one of the key people of the Saudi Arabian government as a director of Newcastle United, which is something that they're not willing to do. Or number two, the Premier League to reconsider um, and, and maybe change that requirement and all of that kind of stuff in terms of, um, you know, not, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the right word here. Can the Premier League maybe come to a, an agreement, some sort of legal agreement, where they say, okay, well, we haven't, we haven't taken your word for it, that PIF or a separate entity of the Saudi government. But, for example, um, will you agree to certain sanctions if anyone in the Saudi government has ever seen to be publicly trying to influence Newcastle United? That doesn't seem too unrealistic to me, but then I'd, I'm not an expert in this kind of stuff. I just, I just think we've got a willing seller, a willing buyer, and a willing fan base. So how can it happen? And know, it's mental, isn't it? Carl, I'll give you the next one. Yeah, uh, this one's from Sean Wade. Hi, Alex. Before this takeover news broke, there was a planned meeting with the trust and Mike Ashley. With all this uncertainty, are the trust going to push for this meeting still? Also, Ashley said that the trust could instruct an accountant to go through the books. Any development? I think you've you've kind of answered that already, haven't you, mate? But yeah, I mean, just just a comment there, but Sean, thanks for your question, Sean. I wouldn't say there was a planned meeting. Um, nothing was concrete, but there were discussions. And that was positive from Newcastle United that they were willing to engage in that way. I mean, it's one thing to say it, it's another to do it. Um, but that was positive and I absolutely would, would want to speak to him. We're desperate to speak to him. I think he should be speaking now to supporters about his plans for the club and moving forward and what's going to happen this season. Um, yeah, the accounts are going through the books. You know, it's taken a backseat, hasn't it? Because we're also concentrating on the takeover. The takeover doesn't happen. We'll absolutely take up the club's offer to look through the accounts. And the club said they would pay for an accountant of our choosing. 
to look through their accounts and books and, and see what's been going on. So yeah, that's definitely going to be a priority moving forward should this takeover not go through. Cool. We'll have one more question before we take a quick break. Um, this one, uh, you will have seen this again, LW Newcastle. He's uh, actually just commented and also sent in a WhatsApp earlier on for the same question. Yes, I would really like to know exactly what Mike Ashley's up to because as far as I know, he's the key to this lock situation. Is he, Alex? No, I'll, dis I'll disagree with you there, mate. Um, I think Mike Ashley is, is, is as desperate for this takeover as PIF, Amanda Slavery and the Rubin brothers. He, he probably has the most to lose here uh, in terms of getting away from the club with an incredible amount of money considering how badly he's run it over the past 13 years. Um, I'd like to just repeat what I just said. I would love to hear from him. You know, what is he doing with the Premier League? You know, Amanda Stavely spoke to us at the Trust and said what we could do as fans to help. What, what, is there anything from Mike Ashley that we could do to help? But well, we don't know because he, wants, he doesn't speak to anyone. So we could definitely do with hearing from him. I totally agree. But I think I think he's probably blameless so far in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the takeover not going through. Okay, brilliant. Right, we'll take a little quick break. Uh, Alex, go and get a drink. Um, we'll say goodbye to Carl because we're going to bring in Matt in and we'll be back with you in a couple of minutes you're watching the black and white show with newcastle fans tv so that was fantastic and we are going to be bringing you a few sponsors and the first one that we're talking about today is three retro i've got owen with me and i've also got sam with me owen have you ever purchased something from three retro yeah i've purchased from three retro before their shirt quality is absolutely amazing you'll find a range of shirts on there um old uh, old shirts from the 90s and even older than that you can find ones from the 70s on there as well good quality shirts i have to agree and the delivery is actually really quick considering we've just um came in and out of a pandemic as well uh, i'm currently wearing mine one mine's from the 93 94 season feels nice you can get loads of different sizes you can get medium you can get extra large it goes all the way up and the great thing about three retro sam is that they deliver worldwide as well isn't it just I myself plumped for the uh, 1995 brown ale one, the one and only, after my lovely mother donated mine to a charity shop some years ago. I needed to replace it. They're extortionate on eBay. So free retro, very reasonably priced, quick delivery, absolutely seamless. And it was only £30 for that shirt, which is an absolute bargain. If you spend over £50, you get free delivery as well which is absolutely fantastic and now more and more shirts owen are more mm. retro shirts in particular are becoming more and more popular you see a lot of fans wearing away shirts and home shirts going back 20 plus years yeah definitely i mean uh for someone who wasn't born in that era it's brilliant to see um and brilliant to get hold of those shirts from that era because they are the most beautiful yeah i, I don't think we've had that that amazing quality of shirt since maybe the early 2000s so it's brilliant to be able to get your hands on them for a reasonable price with quick delivery what more, 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 more could you want brilliant owen's a lot younger than us too me and sam but on the website they don't just do newcastle united stuff so if you've got friends and family in a divided household of different fans they do several of other clubs they also do national kits we've got a lot of england shirts available as well there's a link in the description Get yourself on the three rep row, get a bargain whilst you're there. Welcome back to the Black and White Show with Newcastle Fans TV. Yeah, everyone, welcome back to the uh, Black and White Show. And I forgot what show I was doing there. <laughs> um, we've got Alex with us and we're joined by Matt as well. We've said goodbye to Carl. Um, Matt has a few questions to fire at you as well, Alex. And Matt, I'll leave it up to you. Smashing even, lads. How are you doing? Not bad. Good. Thanks, Matt. Right, brilliant. Uh, just I want to touch. We've touched on it briefly in the first half of the show, um, but I was just wondering how frequently the trust is actually in contact with the club. Obviously, we know you're in contact with uh, the Premier League, but how often those meetings happen, and what's kind of discussed in those meetings for people that don't know? Okay, it's uh, it's been complicated a bit by coronavirus. Before that, we worked with the club last summer to come up with a new fan structure, where there would be four sets of four different meetings a year. So, for example, one of the meetings on ticketing and loyalty points and stuff like that. The other was on the club communication and marketing. The other was on equality and diversity. Um, and I forget the fourth. Um, so there was four structured meetings there. And on top of that, we were going to meet with, with Lee Charney up the crisis season. Um, we had regular contact with them 
up until coronavirus about a few different issues that have gone on, things that crop up. Would we like to be involved a lot more? Of course we would. Um, the club have, have reacted badly to the coronavirus situation. It's a unique situation in football, never mind you know, to the world, but they've you know, the furloughed staff, which which means that there's loads of people getting incorrect season ticket refunds at the minute. And the the club are, are very bad at, at dealing with it or getting back to people because they don't have enough staff there. Uh, there's all sorts of things we can help with. When we look at the likes of Man City, Tottenham, Liverpool, Arsenal, the return to football in October when we're allowed back in ground to schedule for October. All of the clubs there work with their supporters just about, you know, feedback, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's... Uh, it's not, you know, it, there is a way that the club could work with the supporters that it chooses not to. Things have got a lot better since we relaunched the trust. Why have things got a lot better? Because we started accruing members, because we got up to seven, 8,000 members, then we got to 10,000 members. The more of us that there are, the louder our voice is and the harder we become to ignore. Brilliant. And I don't want to dwell on it too much, but obviously the takeover has been a talking point massively over the past couple of weeks. Uh, in the email you sent out to members uh, last week following the, the Premier League letter from Richard Masters, it suggests that there's more questions raised by it than questions that it answered. So um, what's kind of still unclear? What are you kind of hoping to hear from the Premier League now that that statement's been released? Well, I think definitely the stuff about arbitration, when the process hadn't completed. Remember, the Premier League haven't made a decision on this takeover. You know, me, I'm a simple person, OK? If these people aren't suitable to be our owners, why have they not failed the test? That is that's one of the first things I'd expect to hear. And in addition, you know, they've talked about arm's length and and you know all this kind of stuff. Well, we'd just like to know some more about that because the buyers have been very vocal, and that's the problem for the Premier League. Amanda Stay, we spoke to us, we spoke to George Colton, she spoke to other people about this process, and she's made very clear how unhappy they are with the way the Premier League have behaved. The Premier League have yet to really go into a lot of the you know the reasons they've kind of given very very big answers in that letter almost dismissive you could argue give us some proper answers give us some proper information i think we're trying to get transparency for supporters here um, and if we can get some answers for some supporters and they also help the buyers then great i mean this statement kind of bats the ball back to the uh, the piss and the prospective owners so is the ball in their court? Like, is there what's the next move in your opinion? Is, is it with the owner? Is, was it with the buyers, or is it with the Premier League? Is it with the fans pushing for more answers from both? Because obviously they, they've kind of stated that they, they remain interested despite pulling that bid out. So who's making the next move here? Million dollar question, isn't it? It's it's a real hard one. I think we'll know a little bit more after Wednesday from a fans' perspective. You know, maybe we'll make contact again with, with the man that's and see what she thinks. Because she gave us very clear instructions last time. And I think I like to think we did a good job of that. And we got we got the, the Premier League to finally wake up and at least say something. Not enough, but something. You know, like I said before, just in the first half, we could really do a hearing from Mike Ashley on this. You know, as a proper statement or an interview with him to support as address to support as not the Sky Sports News, but the support as saying this takeover is still alive. In my understanding, from the Premier League, is the only person that can withdraw the bid for the takeover is Mike Ashley. All of the all of the communication has to go through the member club of the Premier League, which is Newcastle and their owner, Mike Ashley. He says, no, no, I'm not taking this off the table. I want to make sure we've got a resolution here, get the club sold. I promise the Porter that we're going to do everything we can to keep the club healthy and competitive in the league. I think that would go an awful long way because for the first time, we know that Mike Ashley wants to sell the club and he's got an agreed price. He's got a buyer. So if this is possible... Yeah, let's hear from him a little bit. And I agree, the buyers are probably going to have to, you know, if 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 there isn't any comeback to the Premier League privately between the two of them to try and resolve their differences, and there is more fan action that could make a difference, that will probably have to come from from them rather than us. And you mentioned the Wednesday's meeting coming up, um, just in your answer there. So, what are you kind of hoping as a as a trust to get from that meeting? Uh, we're hoping for the for some uh, some more answers on on why the Premier League have behaved the way they've behaved, on the lack of transparency and the fact, you know, we spoke again in the first half of the show, confidential process, is it? Well, well how come everything's leaked to the media? How come, how come everyone knew about piracy and all this kind of stuff? All of that came from the Premier League, you know. These weren't clickbait journalists at some no mark website that were saying they had Premier League sources. This is Sean Engel of The Guardian, one of the biggest football writers in the country, most respected. This is the Financial Times saying that they spoke to sources high up in the Premier League. Um, so we'd like to we'd like to push them on that, and we'd like to push them more probably on the Saudi Arabia stuff, and 
well, hang on, you, you, you've come to a decision, then you're off on arbitration. Again, from my very simple way of looking at it, why, why do you need arbitration? Well, you, you either believe them or you don't. Sounds like you're not too sure of yourselves. And then maybe we'll, we'll try and push them again on on why they haven't just failed a bid. You know, Newcastle United has, has been thrown into turmoil, turmoil because of this. Three wins in 10 games, I think it was, or two wins in 10 in the lockdown periods, so you have the manager in Newcastle United coming out saying this is no good to me, they need to make the decision. What can the Premier League say about that? Why did it happen? How, how are they going to stop it happening again? Because let's be clear, whether it's these buyers or another one, whenever it may be, we can't go through this again. It's been an absolute joke. Mm -hmm. And sticking with Wednesday, but kind of moving away from the takeover, in the um, email sent to members, it said that you were discussing the kind of return to yeah. fan, uh, return to stadiums for fans. Has there been any hints dropped by the Premier League about like when that might be or giving you anything to go off before going into the meeting? I think there's been some discussion with the FSA, Football Sports mm -hmm. Association. Stuff I've read um, has been October. You know, I know it's not just up to the Premier League, it's government and social distancing measures. Um, you know, at Newcastle, we don't have the biggest of concourses. I think concourses are a big part of it. Toilets are a big part of it. Some of ours are a disgrace. <laughs> And, you know, the lack of room in them, com compared to someone like Brighton or Spurs, who've got brand shiny new stadiums with all this room. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'd imagine they might be able to get more capacity into their ground than others. There's all these complicated things, though, about your house, stuff I don't know about your household bubble and that. And, you know, if you've got a season ticket with your two kids, why shouldn't you be able to go together? Because you spend all your time together. You know, will it be loyalty points that choose what people get, what games will they do at randomly? I think the big concern on all that is that Newcastle United still haven't said nothing, whereas other clubs mm -hmm. are than our supporters. Right, that's all from me, Lee. Thank you very much. Let's crack on with the preloaded ones and we'll check uh, the WhatsApp questions. Uh, he has one uh, from you, Alex, which obviously you've seen earlier on on your own Twitter. Uh, why would you, I think he means the Premier League, block a deal that's worth millions, if not billions, in investment into the country in the North East on the back of recession? Further crippling the financial state of the country, and you've kind of touched upon briefly why the Premier League have, have kind of sat on the fence about it, but more of a case of the community, Alex. There's obviously um, Newcastle is predominantly now turning into a student accommodation. I personally feel that's my own personal opinion, but the area could still do with a massive improvement. What's your thoughts on that? Well, it's a good point, isn't it? Because and that's why I think a lot of MPs, not just in the North East, but outside of the, the North East, have got involved in this. And, yeah, it's, it's something that we'll have to put to the Premier League on Wednesday and hope they, they give us some answers. You know, I, I agree with that, and I appreciate the Premier League would probably only look at this from a football point of view. But at the end of the day, the Premier League markets itself as the biggest league in the world, the most popular league. It brags about how much money is brought into this country in the game because of its member clubs. And that's all true, by the way. But, you know, Manchester's benefited from it massively. London's massively benefited from foreign ownership. Why is it us? That's what Newcastle fans are feeling. Why is it us who, who, who are finally the ones where the, the turn runs to actually know, lads, you, you kind of do that because of some weird link between a government and a company. To normal football fans, that just seems insane. So they need to explain themselves a bit better, I think. Cool. Matt, I'll let you have the, the ninth one, well, the eighth one. Cheers. So John Johnson over on Facebook asked, what can we fans abroad do for the NUST? or in general, to help with different arenas? Should we have our own voice? Great question, John. Um, I think that uh, foreign fans and fans who live abroad, first of all, by joining the trust, you're already making a difference. You can ask uh, fellow fans to get involved. We did and, and do want to launch um, different trust bodies for different parts of the world. We plan to, to launch an NUST North America you know, we're just volunteers, unfortunately, so I, I, I didn't get round to it as quickly as I'd liked. Um, there's definitely an argument to say that there should be, you know, something like NUST North America to independently talk to the club because, you know, Spurs are a great example of this. For example, they have a, a great relationship with the North American fans to Newcastle United. I don't think so. I don't think they have a great relationship with any fans. Um, so I definitely agree that there could be some sort of independent dialogue with the club about issues which relate to fans around the world. There has to be a willingness, though, from the football club, and that's not something I can force. However, if we could go to the football club and said we'll have 10,000 fans based in North America, much harder to, to ignore. And we do have 10,000 fans in North America, by the way. We have far more than that. A huge following for Newcastle over there. So join the trust and, and we'll get there. 
And the last one for the preloaded ones is uh, from Stephen Cleland over on Facebook. Since Richard Master's response uh, for the letter to the PMP, which is Che Nora, has the NUST had any direct dialogue with Amanda Stavely slash Room Brothers for the thoughts and opinions on that letter itself and what was the feedback? No. Uh, no, I haven't had any direct dialogue on um, on the letter. Um, it's not the kind of thing, you know, I think if, if, if she's got my details last time with... with we had a really good communication and we've had a good relationship since. But, you know, we, we know what we've got to do on Wednesday. Um, you know, if, if if they thought they could give us some steer or direction, that would be massively appreciated. Um, but we, we, we don't kind of, you know, there's busy people. We don't, we, don't, we don't feel like we have to take direction from them at every single point. Um, she's been very complimentary. I know we did the live Zoom event last week and she read out a statement, which was, you know, humbling to, to hear that how much how grateful they were to not just Waters Trust, but all the supporters in Newcastle who who got behind them in their bid and tried to make a difference. Cool. Right, then let's have a look at the WhatsApp. Can you guys uh, see this? It should now be blowing you up to uh, full screen. Looks a bit jarred, but I'll bring it up now. We've got some WhatsApps to come through for you, Alex. Um, question for you, Alex. Uh, are you confident that the Saudi-led takeover isn't dead yet? Do you believe there is still much in the running? Yeah, like I said before, Willing buyer, willing seller, willing fan base. Surely they can make it happen. Um, I don't have any inside information on that, but uh, I, I I believe they're still trying to make it happen. So yes, I do think it's alive. Okay, a uh, bit of a lengthy one. This one. Um, oh my lord, that is lengthy. Um, let's see if I can try and break that down for you. Uh, a few questions from me, folks, on the Premier League rather than buyers. There's been many reports outside interference in the process. The letter from Chi has no outside interference was allowed. Just trying to break this yeah, down. I'll just, I'll just dip in there because yeah. it says what it says was it, it was really interesting. They didn't say that there was no attempt at outside interference from the club. What they said was the approval process is solely led by the board. And that's something we're going to try and get clarity on. If you want to just say that no one, like the man with David alleges, try to influence this pro process from another club, that needs said. What they've done at the minute is avoided avoided that question by saying, basically saying, even if the had, it wouldn't make any difference. Well, no, we need answers here. We need to know if other Premier League clubs are trying to prevent the sale of Newcastle United. What about um, the link with uh, Mr. Hoffman, with the uh, his links to Qatari, uh, Alex? I don't, I don't know enough about that. Um, I, I don't believe he's at the meeting on Wednesday. I think it's Richard Masters and Bill Bush, uh, two integral people at the Premier League. Um, but I don't, I don't know a bit enough about him. Yeah, he's been getting a bit of uh, highlighted in the last week or so, hasn't he? Uh, Liam from London, who's a regular commentator, says, thoughts on the negativity, this potential takeover, this time from the Singapore group. If the Saudis deal doesn't exist, everyone will be getting excited about it. I think it's the case, you said it earlier on, Alex, is that we've gone through so many takeovers the last three years alone. Is that It's a feel of a case of, here we go again, isn't it? No, I, t I totally agree. My, my thoughts on, if you look at Amanda Staveley and her consortium this time, uh, at it for over a year. Yes, there was a little bit of leaked press from the Wall Street Journal in January. Beyond that, it was Companies House and Newcastle fans getting the bid out there in terms of the changes on Companies House. They kept quiet. Any buyer, just keep quiet and then we can get excited about it when it's done. Next one, it's uh, a fan from Norway. Nice to see you on board. Uh, he says he's got very little news about the takeover over Norway, um, but he does ask the question, Alex, what do you think will happen in the next few weeks? Yeah, it's a, it's a real tough one, isn't it? As we get closer to that season and there's got to be players sign we need a striker. I think attention will turn more back onto the first team, particularly as we're playing pre-season friendly, stuff like that. Um, like we said earlier, I think all three have agreed. We'll need to hear from Mike Ashley and the buyers probably to know what's going to happen next. Totally agree. Mac, if you can say that, do you want to read the next one? Oh, I need my eyes tested. Uh, we've done what Amanda Stavely asked. What are the consortium going to do now? We need an answer ASAP so we can move on. Yes, I agree. I can't answer it, but I agree that some, some clarification would be would be useful from all sides. Okay. Adam, who's a part of our team over on Facebook, asks, Alex, do you see relegation this season inevitable under Bruce and Ashley? If they stay, what players will improve us under the reported £30 million budget? It's the first football question you've had all night, Alex. Yeah, it's a concern, isn't it? Because we ended last season with, what, four or five wins from the last 21 games? Relegation form, isn't it? And unless there's some real quality 
who knows? What I would say, if we keep everyone fit, if we keep the spine fit, Dubravka, the cells, Hayden and Shelby, and maybe Dwight Gale up front with ASM and Almiron, there's enough about them to to at least keep us competitive in games. But you, you really need to see some quality, particularly up front, added to give her a fighting chance. Yeah, we need goals 100%. We're going to have another video about all of that. Um, this is from Unknown, and um, I just want to actually highlight some of the great work, and Alex and you'll probably echo that, is the, the MPs getting involved, several of them, which is absolutely fantastic to see them fight uh, for the right for Newcastle fans. Uh, but he just asked at the walk towards the very end there, he asked about why the PI, PIF gone so quiet all of a sudden. Well, they haven't said much, have the PIF, throughout this process. We, 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 I don't know if we heard from them at all. You know, we've heard a lot from Amanda Stavely. We've heard stuff from, from Jamie Rubin. Um, but I'm not sure that PIF have, have talked at all. And you know what? I, I, I quite respect that. You know, I understand. Like, we, we've just talked about the Singapore bid and how much noise they're making. It looks like PIF do their business behind closed doors, and you've got to respect that. It might be a cultural thing as well. Um, we, you know, we, we know they turned up with a massive vision for Newcastle United and for reasons that seem pretty confusing to them. It hasn't happened so far. And the last one is from LW Newcastle, who's been on Twitter and YouTube. He's busy boy tonight. Um, does Ashley blame the fla- does Ashley blame the fans, Alex? Does he? Um, I don't. I don't think he blames the fans for this takeover. I mean, we don't know what he thinks, but I don't, I don't think he blames the fans. I think what what we were saying last time was it would be nice to know from Ashley if there's anything that he feels we could do. Just like Amanda Stavely gave that similar direction. So, no, I don't think he blames the fans at all for this. And I just want to ask uh, yourself, Alex, why should people become a member of the NUST? They should become a member because as Newcastle United fans, particularly in the last 13 years, we have been um, downtrodden, we've been ignored, we've been insulted at times by the people that own the club. And we'll, we'll have to come together as one and we'll have to come together as one voice. And like I said earlier, we don't have to agree on everything, but we all agree that, I think we all agree, Newcastle United should be more than it is now. And I want to support a football club that is genuinely interested in what its supporters believe. The supporters trust is open and democratic. So if you're watching this now and you're not a member, you join up today and get involved in September. This time next year, if you're interested, it could be you being interviewed by the two lads here. If anyone, the trust exists for anyone. It isn't a club. It's, it isn't something which only a few people run. We're 14,000 members. It's a, lot, it's a lot of Newcastle fans have, have come together to make their voice heard. And we want to do that with the media. We want to do that with the football club and give them genuine feedback on how they run. We want them to speak to us and take ideas on how to do things better. So if you're interested in Newcastle United, if you're a supporter, the supporters trust only exists for you. You look at why does Newcastle United exist right now? And a lot of people would say, well, it exists to showcase the sports brands of the, of the owner. Sports Trust not like that. It only exists for, for fellow supporters to have a voice and, and, and try and influence the way the club is run. So if you're a Newcastle United supporter, it's for you. Yeah, great word. Uh, I just want to highlight George Colton, Alex, because I'm sure you'll want to say some good words about him. How important and how big of an influence has he been for you and the Nust? Yeah, that's great. That's a picture there from him in my old house, which I've not seen. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he was recording a podcast. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're really lucky, I think, in the North East that we've got some brilliant local journalists um, who really care about the club. You know, you've got Mark Douglas at the, and, and, and others at the Chronicle as well who, who pick up some stick, but can anyone say they don't genuinely care about the football club? I, I can't. You know, George has been great. He's, he's, uh, he's a huge advocate for the trust. Um, he's a he's a good person. I know he's got a lot of excellent contacts in the game because of his excellent work, first at the Times and now at the Athletic. And same with Chris, who, who works alongside them. We're really privileged at the trust that they've they've done what they can to to help us. Uh, I like to think because they they understand the things I've said before and the support in the sport, the idea of transparency and fan action in football clubs. So yeah, he's he's been a huge help. We can't thank him enough. Yeah, he's been absolutely brilliant. I think a lot of people is. Everyone go, is his go-to man now, which is fantastic to see. And obviously, he's a well-accomplished journalist as well. Um, if Matt's got any other questions, Matt, get your thinking cap on. But um, I just want to ask you, Alex, as well, where do you see the NUST in 12 months? What do you want to achieve? What I, what I, what I want to happen is the club to be taken over and to, be have, and to have a, a brilliant, open relationship with the new owners of Newcastle United, who, in my opinion, the people involved now, they respect fan opinion, they're interested in fan opinion, and they realise that 
that fans can give an input on how to help help them run the football club. And as long as you run the football club for the fans, I think I think you can do anything. You can achieve anything, particularly in Newcastle United. So that's what I want to happen over the next twelve months. Speaking more realistically, if the takeover doesn't happen, I want to continue to grow the membership. I want to be sat here with you lads on twenty thousand members, um, and 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 have made progress with Mike Ashley with Lee Charmley to try and give them some genuine feedback and ideas on ways to improve their running of the football club so that it's more beneficial to me, you two lads, and everyone watching this this channel. Any questions, Matt? I just one, if, if we could try and end on a positive note, if there is one. I was just wondering, like, in your opinion, is there, like, a, a silver lining to the whole situation? Obviously, with the takeover falling through, all the fans are pulling in the same direction now. And you mentioned earlier on that in lockdown, we didn't play our best football because there was this uncertainty hanging over the club. With the takeover falling through, we can kind of get our heads down, knuckle down as a fan base, but also as a club with those players focusing and pulling forward. While we might not be the best under Mike Ashley, is that like a, a silver lining for you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a great point. I think that I've been heartened by people who traditionally haven't got on coming together by, you know, the video that you guys did there reaching out. And that's, you know, that's not a trust thing. That's, that's just fans off their own back. Thinking, hang on here. If we can show that we're united and we're together, you know, it's a real positive message for the fan base. I think you've seen, you've seen the, the support do a lot of great things. You've seen money still raised for the food bank despite not being games played at St James's Park. You've seen all sorts of, of, of positive things happen like that, and people come together and think, you know what, we're Newcastle United, and together we can do anything. And I wish the people who run the club now felt like that because if I ran the club or if you ran the club. You think you know what the the potential that we've got as a city, as a region, as a football club. I don't think there's anywhere else in the country that can match that, particularly in terms of that passion from supporters. So it, it has been positive in that respect. I'm really good at that. So far, we don't have the outcome that we deserve, in my opinion. And I just hope that uh, something can happen in the in the coming week or two to to reverse that. Because, like I said before, all the takeover rumours, we've never had a willing buyer, a willing seller and a willing fan base. We've got all three here, so it must be possible. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you so much for coming on once again. Um, I'm going to urge you all to join the NUS. The link is in the descriptions at the very top of this video. We all members ourselves. They're your voice. If you want your voice heard, that's a place to go, go and help grow the Newcastle United Supporters Trust. Alex, thank you once again. Matt, thank you. Carl for earlier on. Thanks, lads. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.